Have you ever imagined traveling to distant land, leaving everything behind you? Your family, your memories, your friends, a good job, everything. For the sake of one noble goal, seeking knowledge. It's like in the Indiana Jones movies, the adventurer Dr. Henley Walton, Indiana Jones Jr., a professor of archaeology, who makes those fantastic knowledge-seeking journeys, trying to unlock hidden secrets and treasures and bringing them to light. Well, in 1998, I embarked on a similar journey when I left my homeland of Palestine towards the United States after being awarded a Fulbright scholarship. At that time, I was obsessed with the same noble goal, and that was unlocking knowledge, finishing my master's first and my doctorate, not in archaeology, but in journalism and media studies. You would think that the time of treasure hunting and unlocking secrets is over. But I would show you that I found out through the journey that I will share with you today that it was not, and that there is still a lot to go after. The secrets that I am talking about are the colonized and misrepresented histories of the indigenous peoples of the world. I started this journey by rereading Indiana Jones or unreading it as the father of post-colonial school, Professor Edward Said invited us to do. Indiana Jones, the scholar adventurer who usually ventures into hostile lands or hostile indigenous lands across the globe, but he ends up usually finding treasures and wealth. Instead of knowledge, killing few natives in the process and bringing enlightenment to the rest of the savage na natives in those dark lands. So my journey, unlike that of Indiana Jones, turned into decolonizing such films and narratives. You see, history is usually written by the colonial conquerors, the powerful, and the occupiers, not the colonized natives, the indigenous, and the occupied. This is how we have been forced to celebrate Columbus and his conquest of the Americas in this country for cent centuries when we were supposed to celebrate indigenous peoples and their perseverance and heroic survival of genocide. The major reason why I embarked on my journey to the US was to unlock the secrets of why has the image of Palestinians been very negative in the US and why don't Americans just understand what I have known all my life. We Palestinians are struggling for our liberation from a colonial force, which is the Israeli one. I left everything behind just to discover that knowledge in the US is controlled and skewed, especially when delivered by corporate sponsored media that have become a major learning tool in the US society or media as pedagogy, as we like to call it in academia. Having finished my doctorate in digital media, I started this long journey from seeking knowledge into critiquing and challenging knowledge into eventually decolonizing knowledge by producing it. So let's unpack this. First, after a few years of studying media production and knowledge production, I started realizing that it was equally important to challenge institutions of knowledge and media production. If we are to narrate our own stories, we come across the challenge of accessing mainstream institutions. This is similar to the constant struggle of other marginalized groups in the US, like Blacks, Native Americans, and Latinx. We all have to constantly challenge the dominant media tropes that socially construct us in society as aggressors, one-dimensional evil characters, just like the ones you see in the Indiana Jones films. I shifted from my focus on knowledge production, such as writing academic papers and articles, presenting at conferences and the like, into narrative and film production. And this is how my award-winning film, 1948, 
creation and catastrophe was born. It took 14 years to take the film from a concept or out of a concept into existence when it at last premiered at the Arizona International Film Festival in 2017. This transformative journey took me back to Palestine seeking knowledge where I left in 1998. I thought that the first step to peace in the region was understanding. That leads to justice, that leads to peace. Therefore, when I started the first phase of my field work, I wanted to focus on the refugees and their stories. Although I am of Palestinian origin, I'm not a refugee. I grew up in the city of Al Khalil or Hebron under Israeli military occupation one of the harshest colonial regimes in the world, and part of the ongoing Palestinian Nakba or catastrophe. I remember a childhood of long curfews, closures, and night raids. However, it was only when I met my husband that I realized that his experience as a Palestinian refugee was still different from mine. So my film journey started with my field work in the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria in 2006, after getting few grants and buying equipment and going there. While I was studying the refugees, natives of exile, as they evolved from one generation to the next, and how those narratives shaped their memories and their identities, I also wanted to create a short video about life in the refugee camps um, that could be used as a classroom resource. However, my work was interrupted by the Israeli invasion of Lebanon that same year. So in 2007, I met my work partner of 12 years, Andy Tremlett. I had intended to return to the region and continue my project in 2008, but Andy persuaded me to switch to a somewhat different film project, a historical narrative of 1948, the year of the creation of the State of Israel and the destruction of the Palestinian nation. For him, it was essential to understand the past in order to understand the present, especially for an average American audience like him. The film, therefore, is a primer to the present. We teamed up and started a new chapter in this journey that none of us have thought would take 12 years to finish. We faced so many roadblocks from funding to access to information to attacks by the Israeli lobby and its many arms, but we persevered. Over nine years of hard labor, we were able to conduct over 90 interviews in seven countries and in three different languages. We interviewed the well-known historians on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, Palestinian refugees and Israeli fighters of 1948. We were able to amass a vast amount of archival materials, including 2,000 images and film clips from 1948. We had access to an extensive collection of both documents and photographs at the Israeli archives after hitting many roadblocks. As I said earlier, knowledge is sometimes framed, structured, skewed, and even locked. And that's what the Israelis have perfected. After Israel declassified many documents from 1948, after the 50-year embargo had ended in 1998, the Israeli authorities went back and reclassified many of those documents after the so-called new Israeli historians used them in their scholarly work. So in 2010, Prime Minister Netanyahu, at that time, extended the embargo on classified documents from 50 to 70 years. Now it has been extended again to 90 years. All of the military orders featured in the documentary came from Israeli archives using an Israeli scholar for access, Rana Sila. However, historians agree that there are still huge piles of archival materials still hidden and sealed, especially about the massacres committed against Palestinians. There have been attempts over the years by many scholars, researchers, and filmmakers to gain access to documents and photographs 
from the town of Deir Yassin specifically, for example, and the massacre committed against the Palestine, its Palestinian citizens in 1948. But all have failed. And the Israeli government extended the embargo to 2012, then 2018, then 2038. We will never see those images of brutally murdered Palestinians or read these testimonies until the year 2038 if we actually live to see those. However, we didn't give up. And in 2016, our Israeli researcher, Rana Sila, submitted a formal request to the Israeli government to get access to some classified documents we needed for our film. But our request was also denied again. This is one way of the many attempts to erase any traces of the existence of Palestinians and their history. And just when we gave up on narrating the story of Deir Yassin, we had a breakthrough when out of all places, we found a survivor of the massacre by the name of Aziz Aqal, who had a brother he introduced us to in San Diego. Uthman Aqal, the brother, also a survivor, had a wealth of memories and information on the massacre. This discovery took us eight months back in production, especially when we were able to find the Israeli commander who was in charge of cleaning up the massacre, who also agreed to be interviewed on camera. So in spite of hiding and locking most archival materials on Deir Yassin by the Israeli government, we managed to bring the story of Uthman Aqil and the other survivors of one of the worst massacres against Palestinians to light through eyewitness testimonies of the people who either survived survived the brutality of the massacre or created it. <clears throat> the Palestinian National Archives have been destroyed twice, first in 1948 and then again during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. And the destruction of Palestinian cultural, historical, and documentary legacy continues today. So there is an urgent need to produce more films conduct more interviews, and collect more information. There are so many stories that we couldn't fit into our documentary. Another main challenge that anyone attempting to tell this story will face in the future is that we have lost so many of the people who lived through these atrocities. The interviews we conducted were the last ever given by many of the women and men in our documentary. The last eyewitnesses are passing away. So in spite of all the obstacles that our team faced in one modest attempt to decolonize the history of the Palestinian struggle and to challenge the dominant narrative of the hostile Palestinians, we managed to screen the film across the globe, gaining a lot of praise and defying the establishing myths of the colonization of Palestine. When the film was screened in six Australian cities in 2018, including Sydney, the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, the oldest actually in Australia, listed 1948, Creation and Catastrophe, as one of the top five films to watch in Australia or the best of the big screen that week. When we tried to screen the film at the West Hollywood City's Human Rights Speaker series, our screening was rescheduled four different times to silence us by different arms of the Israeli lobby in the US, attempting even to change the city laws to find a loophole that would enable the cancellation of the screening. But our perseverance and insistence on practicing our constitutional right of freedom of speech allowed us actually to eventually screen the film on April 15 of 2019. Our journey is still going and we are still screening across the world in spite of all the attempts to silence us and lock this film away. Therefore, the film is already available on many media platforms, including iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, 
Canopy, which is the Netflix of academia, if you don't know it, and the in-library service Hoopla. It is also available on Rogers Cable, Canada's second largest cable video on demand provider. And when Canopy released the film for free during the few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, it received up to 1,250 views a day. For us, this is a decolonial oral history project, and the film is only one part of it. We have amassed a huge amount of data that we don't want to be hidden or locked on our Google Drive. We want to share it with the world. While we have celebrated as humans the short-lived democratization of information dissemination with the advent of digital and social media, unfortunately, just like a horror movie with a new sequel, now we have new gatekeepers with more powerful tools, especially the use of algorithms that make us all live in ideological tribes or bubbles. But we have to defy and resist. If the two of us could have embarked on this journey over 12 years now, to shed light on a small part of locked knowledge, I'm sure that you all can embark on similar journeys of treasure hunting and unlocking secrets. But unlike Indiana Jones, we don't want this information to collect dust in museums. We want it to interact freely with the world and tell the secrets of our own histories. We can collectively unlock and decolonize knowledge.